Let's take our Bibles this morning and open them to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 is where I'll begin reading in just a few minutes and we'll work our way through this passage of Scripture. Alvin Strait was 73 years old and he really wanted to see his brother. You see, Alvin's brother Henry, his older brother Henry, had a stroke. He could not speak clearly and uh, he had, was physically unable to travel. But Al Alvin really wanted to go see Henry and so he made a decision that he was going to find a way to get there, find a way to see his brother. You see, Alvin's eyesight was also failing and he couldn't actually drive a car. And so Alvin came up with a plan. And that plan was that while he could not drive a car because he didn't have a license, he could drive a lawnmower. And so Alvin bought a John Deere lawn tractor put a 10-foot trailer behind it, and drove on state roads on the shoulder of state roads, couldn't get on the interstate, all 120 miles from Iowa to Wisconsin to visit his brother Henry. It took, it took him six weeks to complete the round trip. He actually stayed with his brother for about four of those weeks. It took him about a week to get there and a week to get back. When the, the journey was over, uh, reporters kind of gathered around him and they began to talk to Henry, or, or rather Alvin, about his story. And they talked to the neighbors. And one of the things the neighbors said was, Alvin knew where he was going. He knew why he was going. And nothing was going to stop him. That's kind of the story of the wise men. They knew where they were going, wherever the star went. They knew why they were going to find the king. And nothing was going to stop them. We're going to talk about the story of the wise men today. And the wise men really are, while not a part of the Christmas story in the sense of, of there that night, they really are a part of Christmas and about all the myth and all the lore of Christmas. And they're a biblical part of Christmas. I think the wise men represent commitment, dedication, and perseverance. These are men who had a goal and they chose to pursue that. And they were going to find the Christ child in that, uh, in the first Christmas story. Goals are not unspiritual. Now you could have some unspiritual goals, but goals in and of themselves are not unspiritual. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty convinced that goals are a good thing. That goals are something that we all ought to have to pursue. And perseverance is certainly a biblical virtue. As a matter of fact, I think it's a forgotten biblical virtue. Perseverance in a lot of ways is being lost in a culture of quitting. If we don't like something, we just quit. We quit on church. We quit on marriages. We quit on, uh, we quit on jobs. We quit on careers. We just quit if we don't like something. And we need to develop a consistent, a culture of consistency, not a culture of quitting. Now we're facing 2022. And I just want to ask you a question. What do you want to do in 2022? What is it that you want to do? I mean, when we get to this point next year, after a year, do you just want to be a year older, a few pounds heavier, and uh, a little bit deeper in debt? I mean, is that like the goal? I mean, that's not a very worthy one, right? What do you want to do in 2022? How would you want your life to be different? How would you want your family life to be different? Your career to be different? How would you like your life to be different? And most importantly, how would you like your spiritual life to be different? See, I think goals are deeply spiritual. And our goals ought to be to pursue the things that God wants us to pursue. I want to give you an, an opportunity over the next few days to decide and make a commitment uh, for spiritual growth in your life. We're going to read through the Bible again as a church. We have a, a reading plan. It begins on Monday, January 3rd. That's the day our reading plan begins. It's five days a week. I like the five day a week reading plans for a reason. If I miss a day, I've got the weekend to make it up. I don't feel like I'm behind. I've tried those seven day a week reading plans. You miss a couple of days and you feel like I am never going to catch up because I got to read today's and I got to read yesterday's and, and it gets discouraging. So it's a five-day reading plan. You can read the entire Bible in 52 weeks by reading three chapters, about three chapters from the Old Testament and one New Testament chapter. If for you, you feel like, well, that's just a little too much for me to bite off. I'm not sure I could do that. You can read the one New Testament chapter a day and you'd read through the New Testament in a year. That would be helpful and, and prompt you toward spiritual growth. And so I want to encourage you to be a part of this. It'll be online on our website, all the daily readings, 
or uh, we'll have some physical, some, hand, uh, some paper copies of it each month for you if you'd prefer to do it that way. Um, uh, and so we're going to try to link that so that you just go straight to version, and you'll be able just to get on your, your phone or your device and read that daily. You can read it in the morning like I do. You can read it at lunchtime, read it at night, whenever you want to. But I want to encourage you to do that and set a goal to do so. The wise men were men who had a goal. And they determined to reach it. Now, there's a little myth and tradition that goes along with the wise men. So let me dispel a couple of things, first of all. One is um, the, their title. Who were they? Sometimes you hear the word, uh, the word magi, sometimes wise men. The, the, the carol says, we three kings. Well, what, what were they? Well, they weren't kings in the sense of rulers. The word magi is probably the most closely associated biblical word, but wise men works because these were men who were very learned. These were scholars. And what they studied most of all were the stars and the heavens. They studied celestial objects. The Chaldeans, where these men come from in the east, they were people who believed that the stars were really significant. And when something new appeared in the stars, that was really, really important. And I'll get to that a little bit deeper in the text. So probably to say they were like the PhDs of the day. They had the highest level of learning of their day. The other thing that um, I would point out to you is that while we are absolutely, absolutely convinced that there were three of them, the Bible never says that. It never does. We say three because there were three gifts, right? And who's going to show up without a gift, right? But, so, um, but, but there were three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so we say three wise men. The Bible just uses the plural. That could be two. That could be 20. We, don't, we really don't know how many of them there were. Now, the Eastern Orthodox Church says authoritatively there were three. And they even say they have the names. Balthazar, Casper, and Melchior. That was in the movie Ben-Hur, the old classic movie with Charlton Heston. Uh, and that was kind of made popular and a lot of people bought into that. That is based solely on tradition and there's not any scriptural evidence for that at all. Of course, the biggest and most widely perpetuated myth about the wise men is that they came to the stable during the first Christmas night. That is probably the, in every Christmas play in a church you've ever seen, they show up at the stable almost. Uh, in every nativity scene, they're mixed in with the shepherds. We have several nativity scenes at our house. And one year, a few years ago, I was preaching on uh, the, the, these, these stories about the birth of Jesus. And I took the three wise men out of the nativity and I moved them all the way across the room and I put them on the piano. And my wife said, what are you doing? And I said, well, they're on the way, but they're not there for the first Christmas. Okay. They're, they're not. As a matter of fact, from the text, we derive that it took them about two years to get there. And that's in the text. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. And we're going to talk about how we could set meaningful goals and learn something from the wise men. First of all, let's look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. And kind of keep your Bibles open. I'll read through this as we move along. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi arrived from the east in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. This is kind of the culmination of this entire journey for these men. And if you're going to make a journey toward anything, if you're going to set a goal, if you want to accomplish something, let me give you four principles you need to remember. Number one, determine what you desire. These wise men show up and they say, we have come to find the king of the Jews. We saw his star, and so we have come to find him. That is what we desire. You need to determine what it is in your life that you desire. Now, it's interesting when we read that, that these, these Chaldean magi, these wise men, these studiers of the heavens, these students of the stars, say, we saw his star in the east. And what they're saying is, we have charted out the 
the planets and we've charted out the stars and the constellations and they were constantly looking at the phases of the moon and the sun and all those sort of things. And all of a sudden one night, they saw a new phenomenon in the heavens. There was a new stellar phenomenon. There was something that they had never seen before. And for the Chaldeans, they believed that when something appeared in the heavens, if there was a new star, we might say when there was a comet passing by and all of a sudden something changes in the stars and the planets, they believed that was of historic significance. Some great event had taken place. It's really interesting to me that the Chaldeans are students of the stars and God speaks to them to draw them to the Savior in a, in a way that they could understand it. I've always found that fascinating. My friends who work in the Muslim world tell me that one of the ways that many Muslims are coming to faith in Christ is by having dreams. They have dreams of either going to meet with someone who will tell them about Jesus or some of them have dreams about Jesus. In Islam, dreams are very, very important. They're significant. And so God is speaking to them in that way. God uses a cultural context in which he many times speaks. And for these Chaldeans, he uses the stars to guide them to the Savior. Now, here's what the Chaldeans would do. They would, they would look at the stars and they'd say, okay, there's something new. Let's look through all the religious scrolls that we have to see if there's anything about a star appearing. If there's anything that would tell us which way to go or what, what nation this, would, this new king is to be born in. 700 years before the birth of Christ, the northern kingdom of Israel fell to the Assyrians. It would be another 100 years before Judah would fall and they would be taken away into captivity. And when they were taken away into captivity by the Chaldeans, these people who eventually would take over that empire, they took with them their scrolls. And those scholars, those wise men, not only studied the stars, but they studied the scrolls of different religions of people they had conquered. And it may well be that they unrolled the scroll that contained the words of the book of Numbers. And they read this. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel. That's in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. A prophetic passage about the birth of Jesus. And they read that. And they said, oh, a scepter will rise in Israel. A, a king holds a scepter. There's a new king who's been born. And the, and the sign of that is that a star shall come forth from Jacob. This star, this new thing that we have seen, it's the new king of the Jews. It's the new king of Israel. We've got to go and see this. If this new king, different from many others, different from any other, causes a disturbance in the heavens, this is a special, special king. And they wanted to meet and see Jesus. You see, their desire was not just to follow a star. It was to find a savior. What they were attempting to do was not just follow this star, but they wanted to find the savior that the star was pointing them to. What I would say to you is that for most of us, we need to remember that the object, that, that, that the object of our goal is different from the strategy of our goal. See, I want you to read your Bible through next year. I really want you to do that. But the goal is not to read your Bible through. The goal is to read your Bible through so that you are more Christ-like, so that you know God better. That's why we read our Bibles. It's not just so we check off the list and say, oh, boy, I did that. I, aren't I special? God owes me something. No. I read my Bible so that I know God. And I know when I'm, face, when I'm facing a choice what the Christ-like thing to do would be because he's told me in his word. So determine what you desire. Psalm 37 verse 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. You know, I have found there are two distractions that I have from, from goals. 
One is what I would just call activities. It's just the mundane, routine activities of life. Sometimes we just get caught up in the alarm clock and getting to work and paying the bills and the stuff that has to be done to maintain life that we miss the big picture. And these men didn't allow that to happen. I don't know about you, but that happens to me a lot. I can just get caught up in in the doing of life, just in the mundane routine stuff. But the other thing that, that gets me off track with my goals is attractions, something that catches my eye. Something that's, that's, that's the, you know, the next bright, shiny object. Now I'll kind of, kind of get my focus over here rather than on my goal. All of us are a bit that way. We, there are just things that can distract us from the things that are really important in our lives. This is bowl season. If COVID doesn't cancel them all, you know, we're going to have college football bowls and championships. And I love college football. So I enjoy this week of the year most of the time. But when teams go to bowl games, there are a lot of things that can distract them. I mean, there you know, there are banquets and all of the teams go to these big meals and in every city they take them to whatever the local attraction is. Like if your team goes to the Rose Bowl, they'll wind up at Disneyland. And, and of course there's a parade and there are all these attractions. But somewhere down the line, the coach is going to stand in front of his team and say, guys, hey guys, we didn't come here for the banquets. We didn't come here for the attractions. We didn't come here for the parade. We came to win a football game. And I think in our lives, we need to remember that God has a purpose for us. God has some things for us to do. God wants wants us to bring him great glory. He wants us to lead other people to faith in him. He's got some things for us to do. And all these bright, shiny objects that we get attracted to, most of them are nothing. They are temporary. They are of this world. And we need to focus on eternal things. Determine what you desire. Number two. There will be a price to pay. You'll have to determine to pay the price. Now look down at verse 3. Let me continue with the story. When Herod, the king, heard this, when he heard these wise men are here looking for this new king of the Jews, when Herod, the king, heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. That's significant. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. The wise men show up in Jerusalem, but it's not that night of Jesus being born that they show up. They tell Herod that they saw this star two years ago. That's when this journey began. And so they paid a price to get there. If you're going to accomplish God's great goals for your life, if you're going to accomplish his will and purpose for your life, you're going to have to determine to pay the price. They paid a price of time. For two years, they traveled. Maybe they were separated from their families for those two years. There was no easy way to travel in those days. They paid a price in commitment. They had to ford the Tigris and the Euphrates River. They traveled through areas that were hostile with bandits known to attack caravans. And they traveled through scorching heat in the Arabian desert in order to get to Jerusalem. They paid the price. And they also paid the price in what I call the risk factor. They show up in Jerusalem looking for the new king. Now, there's, in the ancient world, there's only one way you get a new king. And that's for the old one to die. The problem was the old king is still on the throne. And he is an egomaniac. He was probably paranoid. He was a control freak. Here is a man who was absolutely obsessive compulsive in many ways. And he... He was absolutely defensive of his position and his throne. Herod the Great was a diabolical, cruel man. He was bent on his own glory and, bring, and, and his own aggrandizement. That is who Herod was. And they show up saying, hey, we're looking for the new king. And the Bible says it this way. 
And Herod was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. I've seen these little plaques in some houses that say, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Well, if Herod was troubled, everybody's going to be troubled because Herod's going to make trouble. That's the way this worked. Herod's going to make sure that people are troubled. And so he says, hey, I got I to find out when, when this is going to happen. And so he calls in the scribes and the leaders. And because Herod was Jewish, but he really didn't care much for the faith. He was nominal at best. He says, hey, you guys tell me, because I'm not reading the scriptures. You guys tell me what the scriptures say about where the Messiah is going to be born. And immediately they go to the prophecy that he'd be born in Bethlehem. And so Bethlehem calls in the wise men and he says to them, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Tell you what, you go down and find him and then come back and get me because, oh, I I want to worship him too. Now that was an absolute lie. It was a ruse. All that Herod wanted was the GPS coordinates of this new king so that he could send in his henchmen and take him out. That's all he wants. And We'll get to the end of this story in a few minutes, but Herod demonstrates the great cruelty of his life and of his mentality in just a few minutes. But these wise men were determined to pay the price. There is a price to be paid for spiritual growth. We are people of grace, and I'm glad we are because the Bible is a book of grace, but grace While it is opposed to earning, it is never opposed to effort. And I think for some of us, we think grace means means sit back, relax, and God's just going to pour blessings into your life without any effort. That is not true. If you're going to reach your goal, if you're going to reach your potential in any area of life, it's going to mean you're going to have to pay a price. I'm really looking forward to a movie this week, came out yesterday, called American Underdog. American Underdog is the story of Kurt Warner. And uh, if some of you don't remember him, he was a quarterback for the St. Louis Rams. But Kurt Warner says of his life that he's always been an underdog. He's a committed follower of Jesus and uh, grew up playing football, loved the game of football. But he was not a standout high school player. He wasn't like a five-star recruit. All the big universities wanted him to come play. He finally got an offer from Northern Iowa University to come and play football. When he got there, they had a starter. And so he just sort of labored through practice, paying the price every day, but he didn't, didn't get any starting time, minimal playing time, his first three years in college. Finally, his senior year, he was the starter for the football team because he had paid the price. When he got out of college, He wasn't really a top prospect on anybody's draft board. He did get drafted very late in the draft by the Green Bay Packers. But when Kurt Warner was drafted by the Green Bay Packers, that was the height of Brett Favre's stardom. I mean, Brett Favre was the man for the Green Bay Packers at that time. There is no way Kurt Warner is going to start a football game. He's not going to see the field. Eventually, he's cut by them. He winds up playing arena league football, but he loves the game so much and he really believes he can succeed and so he pays the price again. He pays the price in arena league football by practicing with the team, playing games, and stocking supermarket shelves at night just to pay the bills because arena league football didn't pay anything. Finally, he's picked up by an NFL Europe team. It was back when the NFL Europe was going on. He played quarterback for the Amsterdam Admirals. There were less people at the Amsterdam Admiral games than at the Northern Iowa University games. I mean, there was nobody in the stands, but he paid the price. And eventually he got picked up by the St. Louis Rams to be their backup quarterback. The starter went down and he stepped in and eventually became a Super Bowl champion. All because he was willing to pay the price. You need to remember this. There are no victories at discount prices. Victory will always require that you pay the price. And that's true with your family. That's true in your career. That's true in your education. And that is true in your spiritual growth. You are saved by grace and by grace alone. 
We love to quote Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, that we are saved by grace and not of works. But verse 10 says that we're saved unto good works. We are his workmanship created to do good works. Works are not the root of your salvation, but they are the fruit of your salvation. And so determined to pay the price. Number three, insist that you persist. You must insist that you persist. These wise men never gave up. Verse nine says that after Herod tells them to go to Bethlehem, verse nine says, after hearing the king, they went their way. Look at this. And the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. As they moved, the star moved. As they persevered, the star guided them. The, the inclination that we get from this is that the star moved. The star didn't just stay over the house and they finally found it. The star guided them. The star moved. Now, that's no normal star. Occasionally, some well-meaning scientist who is a follower of Jesus, will, some astronomer will try to associate what, what many people refer to as the star of Bethlehem with a comet or some stellar phenomenon. I really can't, I really don't believe that. I think that what this passage teaches us is that this star was a supernatural creation of God for this moment and for this moment alone because it moved and as they moved, the star moved and guided them. It was a bit like what happens in the, uh, the Exodus when the children of Israel were leaving Egypt and going through the wilderness into the promised land. They were led each day by a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night. And as that pillar moved, they followed that's exactly what's happening with this star. As the star moves, they follow. The wise men follow. And they persist day after day after day. Persistence, nothing takes place unless we persist. That's exactly where these wise men are. They are following on a two-year journey in order to find the Christ child. And then verse 10 says this. When they saw the star... They rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Number four, rejoice when you reach your goal. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. After, verse 11, after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And they fell to the ground and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold frankincense and myrrh and having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod the magi left for their own country and by another way and the star guides them to a house they're not in the stable anymore Jesus isn't laying in the manger they're guided to a house Jesus is described as a child in the Greek language there's a different word for a small child and an infant and the word that is used to describe him is the word for small child. Now, there's a reason that that word is used. Because when Herod asked them, How, uh, when did you see this star? The answer they gave him was two years ago. When Herod finds out that they took the bypass around Jerusalem and did not come back to find him and tell him where the, Jesus is, he sends his henchmen to Bethlehem. And they slaughter Every infant male, every, not infant, but every child uh, uh, who was a male, two years and younger. He had an objective for that. He had, a, he had a point of reference. They had told him, we've been looking for him for two years. That's how, how cruel, how inhumane, how, how power thirsty that Herod was. But the wise men get to the house. And can you imagine this scene? Bethlehem is a small, sleepy little town at this time. It's a, it's a tourist trap now, but it is a small, sleepy little town. The people who live there are blue-collar, 
common everyday laborers. They're landowners and owners of, of flocks of sheep and they're shepherds who work out in the fields. These are average common people. And all of a sudden, this entourage pulls into town, complete with camels. They had to have somebody. They didn't walk all the way to Jerusalem for two years. They've got camels, and, and they're decked out in all this finery. And I don't know how many of them there were, but there were, it was a major scene in Bethlehem for this bunch to show up. And the star stops over one particular house, and they go to the house, and they knock on the door. Can you imagine Mary's shock and her surprise? Joseph's not even mentioned. Who knows? He may have been out, out at work. But he, these men come, and when they come in and they lay eyes on Jesus, the pursuit of their life for the last two years, the Bible says they worshiped him. As a matter of fact, what it says is they fell to the ground and they worshiped him. They gave themselves to a boy king, believing that this child was so important that it had disrupted the stellar constellations with a new star in the sky. This child was worthy of worship. He's still worthy of worship. He's still worthy of you bowing before him and giving your life to him. But they go a step farther. They worship him with themselves and they worship him with their treasure. And they presented him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Gold, obviously costly. Frankincense and myrrh were expensive spices. And they offer these treasures to their Lord, to this new king. And it is still appropriate to worship Jesus with your treasure. I appreciated one thing that was said by one of our church members. I think it was Jim Marks in, in some of the giving videos that we, we showed you over the last few weeks. When he said as much as singing, as much as hearing a sermon, as much as praying is worship. For me, giving is worship. Because it is. And for these wise men, they gave as an act of worship. Giving isn't just an act of paying the bills. It's not your dues to some club. It is an act of worship for your God to bless his work through his church with a portion of what he's given you. It is an act of worship. And so these wise men present themselves and present their treasure as acts of worship before this new king. Now, what's about to happen is that Jesus is going to be taken on a whirlwind trip. God is going to bring Joseph back into the story by speaking to him in a dream. And he says, hey, those wise men did not tell Herod where Jesus is exactly, but Herod knows he's in Bethlehem, and so you need to take off. You got to get out of here. He takes off. Herod sends his henchmen in, and they kill every baby boy, every toddler boy, two years and younger, in that small town. How many it was, who knows? But it showed the cruelty of Herod. But it showed the sovereignty of God. That God would protect his anointed one, his only begotten son. And he would protect his life until the day that that boy grew up to be a man. And he gave his life for you and for me. Let's bow our heads together. Father, we thank you for this wonderful record of what happened in the life of our Savior. We thank you that you've preserved your word and truth for us. And Father, I pray that as your people, our goal would be to seek you. That we, would, that we would move closer to your will, to your purpose, to your call upon our lives. That we would pursue you with a passion. Lord, help us to be people who don't just go through the motions and have church. But people who are passionate about our relationship with Jesus and want others to know him. I pray for those in this room, those who are listening to this this morning, 
who need to make some resolution, some commitment to say, I'm going to seek God in 2022. I'm going to seek truth from his word. I'm going to seek to honor him by sharing my faith with others. I'm I'm going to seek to be a man or a woman of prayer who spends time with my Lord. Father, I pray for those who would make commitments like that in in a moment like this. By your spirit, come and, and, and awaken the desire to fulfill that commitment. But I also pray for those who've never come to know Christ that today would be a day when they turn from their sin and turn to him in faith saying, dear Jesus, I am a sinner. I've broken your commandments and I've sinned against you. But I believe that you lived a perfect life, that you died a sacrificial death for me so that my sin could be forgiven. And I believe that you were raised from the dead to give me the gift of eternal life. So Jesus, come into my life today. Father, for those who would pray a prayer like that, I I ask you to give them courage to step out and to say, I'm going to follow Jesus. I ask you to do that in Jesus' name. Amen.